Let me say a few things to you on prophetic strategy. Then I'll ask daddy to read something. Three guys. It will be good if you have three different colors. So two of you are close. So I need somebody with black. It's to show you the increasing intensity of prophetic activities in the last days. There's so many things to study in prophecy. But when you look at the prophetic documents, which are actually strategy, they are first documents to give the church foresight. God did not give prophecy to put the church in fear. When somebody is teaching end time prophecy and the only thing he's creating is fear, um, the man may be trying, but he might need some other understanding or skill. The Bible talks about being able to mature to the point that you rightly divide the word of the truth. I have done my own research. There are seven major reasons why God gave us prophecy. And I'm not going to go into that. But one of them is so that we will know what is coming. And Jesus talks like that all the time. He will tell his disciples, I tell you these things ahead of the time so that when they happen, you will know. Because to be forewarned to, is to be forearmed. Foresight is power. Those who see the future are the ones that lead it. It's one of the blessings I enjoy in my work with God that God does not allow things to take me on our ways. For some reason, he has always done that. He has always done that for me. And he has protected me. There is a tribe in Israel that have a special gift, the tribe of Issachar. They have understanding of the times. They're able to read and understand prophetic trends where God is headed and where things are headed. And then God also blessed them with the ability to know what Israel ought to do. First Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32. They have two things. They have understanding of the times. They know what Israel ought to do. So you see they have prophetic foresight but they also have prophetic strategies. So I'm combining the two to call it prophetic strategy. A man that operates like that utilizes foresight as a tool for strategy development. What's the use of knowing the future when you don't do anything with it? Deuteronomy 29 verse 29. The things that are hidden belongs to God. That means he doesn't want to share. There are secrets he wants to keep to himself. The secret things belong to God. But the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. For what purpose? That we may do. Prophecy is for strategy and for execution, for function. God gives you foresight so you can utilize it. And he said, don't only use it. Train your children and your children's children. Equip them with this. Prepare them with it. You will put them in a position of advantage. A new year is on the horizon. Which direction is the economy going? Which direction are, are nations going? I'm not waiting for any government to announce budget. I have information of where the whole world is headed. That's why God gave us prophecy. The Bible, that book, can I get one? I want to leave the one I left there because I have documents in it. Can I get one around here? This book is loaded. It has seven layers. Seven layers. So, you know, like you come to a, 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 a mining site and there are layers. Maybe at the first layer, you get sand. Second layer, you get rocks for construction site. Third layer now, you are getting gold. Fourth layer, you are getting some other minerals. 
fifth layer, somewhere you are getting diamond. This book has seven layers. The topmost layer, which is ordinary sand, is historical records and facts. That's the one we call the letter of the word. Okay, Adam ate the forbidden fruit, and uh -huh, you had it. There are people who have spent years. They got PhD on this historical part of the Bible. They have PhD on BK, on Christian religious studies. There are even, even ordained clergymen who have spent years getting PhD and they are not even saved. They don't know the God of the Bible, neither do they know the Holy Spirit. Scripture said that first layer, the letter, it kills. It kills. Some of them are the ones who will argue about Moses dividing the rest. They will tell you, don't mind. There are certain time of the year when the water is very shallow. Moses has studied it. That's when he took the children of Israel to cross. Because he had knowledge. They tend to use their head to figure God out. God is not known by, by computerization, analyzation. He's known by revelation. There is a layer without revelation you don't enter. They don't have access to that. Then you now ask them. If, if it's a particular season when the water is shallow. So Moses knew the path. He took the people to cross. How come the armies of Egypt that are the warriors who should know how to cross drowned? He said, uh, uh, uh. because if truly it's is shallow, and that's why he could take the people across, then it's a bigger miracle that the whole army of Egypt drowned in the same shallow water. There is a layer that is moral instructions. There are commandments, there are ethics, there are ordinances. That layer is to teach us how to live. That layer is to shape your character and your moral values. They, they are biblical ethics, biblical values. Biblical morality. Some people just take some other part and ignore that. So you end up, you don't see their life transformed. They are not godly. They are not righteous. Because that's what that, this layer is supposed to do. To transform you and shape you to be moral and to be godly, to be like Jesus. That layer produces personal transformation. Nobody is supposed to be professing Christianity without being like Christ. That layer will produce humility in you. That layer will produce brokenness in you. That layer will produce contrition in you. That layer will get you on your face in deep repentance when things go wrong morally. There is a layer that is laid, overlaid with principles. By the time you are hitting the moral codes of the Bible, you are starting hitting the treasures. You have now left the surface. You are hitting the gold bed. Where the gold is. That's why you can go to school. Get all the degree you like. Lack morality. You are still an illiterate. Yes. Yes. So this layer is laid with principles, laws, laws. This time, there are no moral laws. They are not the do's and don't. Thou shalt not commit adultery. No, no, no. They are laws of life. They are laws of success. God said to Joshua, this book of the law, shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. Let's take that word meditation. The law of meditation. Then he said, it shall not depart out of your mouth. 
Let's take that other one, the law of confession. Because this has nothing to do with morality. But they decide your future. Your destiny is controlled by your mouth. And what you meditate on is what ends up dominating your future. As a matter of fact, that law of meditation, which is the law of internal picture, is the same law as pregnancy. It is the pictures within that become the realities without. It is what a woman is carrying inside that she will deliver one day. So, you cannot be feasting on pornography and produce a godly life. Neither can I be meditating on righteousness and associating and incubating it and end up producing evil. I just discussed a moral element. But that's how it has to do with destiny. When God was trying to get Abraham to believe him. Genesis chapter 15. The Lord said to Abraham, fear not, I'm your shield and you're sitting in the to verse 3. And Abraham said, behold, to me you have given no seed. Lo, one born in my house is my heir. I want you to notice, God said to a man, I'm your shield and you're exceedingly great reward. I'm your protection. I will protect you. But I'm also your reward. I'm giving you myself in relationship. If you know the power of social capital. The president of a country said, I want you now to become my friend. I have made myself your friend. And the guy started complaining. What, what is that to me? What are you giving me? Since you have not given me a child. That statement hit something. Because what you are saying is, it's true that you need a child. You can say, thank you. You've given me the greatest thing there is. You in my life. But Lord, I also want you to give me a child. But no, that's not how he said it. So what will you give me? God took note of that. He knew, okay, does it mean you value a child more than me? And I can understand Abraham. He's an old man. He has no child. I can understand his pain. I can understand it. But. So God said, let's solve the problem of children first. Then we'll solve this thing you did here later. We'll solve it later. When we get you Isaac, we'll collect it later. That's why that trial came later to put Isaac on the altar. But Abraham passed the test. So he got him back. But how did God solve the problem of barrenness? You might be here now. You've been trying to have a child. You might be here now. You have been dealing with a particular issue that has resisted treatment. This is a man that from the time God called him at the age of 75 till he was 100, it was at the age of 100 that he got this child. 25 years of having a promise that has not come to pass. You know he can wear somebody out. 25 years. He can wear somebody out. So how did God solve the problem? A lot of you are trying to believe God for something. Believe God for another level in your Christian life. There is a law. There are laws of success. One of them is the law of imagination. You see the way you have a womb. Women have womb in the physical. That's how every person God created has an, a womb in the soul. The way you can be pregnant, a woman can be pregnant physically, that's how you can be, a man can be pregnant and deliver. In the world of creativity, the core products created by human beings bring child. So this watch I'm wearing is somebody's brain child. That your dress is somebody's brain child. Every product is created twice. Actually, not just product. Everything is created twice. It's first created internally and later created externally. 
The same way a human being starts from a spirit being but enters the world. That's, women are very dangerous creatures. So. All women are gates. Everybody say women are gates. And it's not gate to your compound. It's gate between the spiritual world and the physical world. What you guys don't know that even once God, God Almighty, wanted to enter the physical realm, all he had to do is pass through a woman. A woman will clothe him with flesh and he will appear here as a human being. Yet his name is Emmanuel, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. But now he's walking among men and human beings did not recognize him. But every time he goes and demons see him, they say, hey, we know who you are. You are the holy one of God. Have you come to destroy? They start shouting. You will tell them, shut up. The human beings don't know who he was. The spirit beings like him know who he was. Do you know that one day, one day, one day, another woman, Satan wants to enter here. Satan is an angel, so a spirit being, but he wants to appear in flesh and blood. One woman, by opening her leg to what she doesn't know, Satan will enter and come out here with flesh and blood. Grow up and end up grabbing global power, the man you call the Antichrist. The difference is that God did not need intercourse. us. What he sent was the word. But in Satan's case, one woman will open her leg for him. You want to know how he would do it? Go and check how he did it in the time of Noah. Angels came here and find women ready to allow them enter into the human realm. You can give a demon an earthly passport as a woman by misapplication of your sexual power. And when that demon gets license, passport, because this is what this body is, he has right to operate on the earth. All these ones we meet now that are screaming, in, you are doing whatever you can. They don't have earthly body, so we drive them out. They don't have license here. They go and possess people. But you see, you meet them in deliverance, you tell them, come out, they come out. The one that has his own body, how do you cast it out? One of the reasons God asks for sexual purity and the sanctity of Christian marriage is so that he can have godly seeds. So God can bring an Isaiah through your family. God can bring a Moses through your family. God can bring a David through your family. God can bring a Solomon, not the backsliding letter in, the good child through your family. God can send a Jeremiah. When he said to Jeremiah, before your mother conceived you, I knew you. Yes, he wants to send such a person. Well, he can send them through your family. God can send them a deliverer to your family. God can send a Moses through your family. God can send a Josiah to your family. God can send the future pastor David to your family. Not so you can give us a nini and Derico and create problem for the world through your carelessness and misbehavior. And it's not just the fact that you can be a gate to bring bad things from the spiritual world. It also matters who you lay with. Men, you need to see something. When a woman carries your seed and gives you a child, that woman has perpetuated your existence. So when your time comes, you can go and you are still on the earth. Stop looking for reincarnation because there is no reincarnation. 
there is incarnation. Any man that has had a child has not died. Did you hear what I just said? You are like a, a tree whose plant, whose seed fell on the ground and produced. As long as that coconut seed is still producing, that coconut has not died. What God gave human beings is the power of reproduction, not incarnation, reincarnation. You want to come a hundred times, train your children to keep perpetuating the lineage and make sure they perpetuate the lineage of the righteous. You are running around looking for money to build houses, to build all that. You must first raise a godly family. There's seven layers in the scriptures. For example, there is a layer you hit. It is the revelation of Jesus. Do you know, starting from Genesis to the last book of the Bible, Jesus is revealed through the whole Bible. When I talk about the moral codes of the scripture, I want you to know that it is not mere commandments. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. No, 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 no. If you start with the do's and don'ts, you have missed it. You would think it's a set of rules, external rules that they are forcing you to obey. No, 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 no. What is going on is that that level is revelation of the nature and the character of God. And God said, I made you in my image after my likeness. So God is showing us this is who you are. This is your moral nature. This is actually how I created you. I did not create you to be a liar. The liar and the father of all lies is Satan. I am a person of integrity and I made you in my image. You are a child of integrity. I, God is love. I made you in my image. You are moral nature is love. I am a God of justice. I made you in my image. You are a person of justice. I am a God of mercy, compassion. I made you in my image. You are a man or woman of compassion. When you say you are my child, this is how we know. It is not by speaking in tongues. It is by this moral nature. That's how we know who is a genuine child of God or not. You carry the DNA. The miracles are the ones the enemy can copy. Not all of them. When he was copying in the days of Moses, there's a place he got to. He couldn't. But that's where Satan can play games. What he can't copy is God's nature. He's a murderer. He's filled with hate. That's why when Cain hated his brother and ends up killing him, God said that Cain that was of the evil one. We know people by their that DNA, their moral nature is what tells me who you are. Not all this shouting you are doing in church. He's a liar. He's divisive. He's very proud. We are talking about the enemy, Satan. He is very rebellious. That's not who you are. Jesus said, learn of me. I'm meek. I'm lowly in the heart. That's your nature. Because that's the divine nature. Oh, my great One of the reasons Jesus came is to reveal the Father again. Show us what he is like. So that we can. Because the law of success I mentioned, imagination, is that whatever picture you keep incubating, you keep imagining, you keep before you, whether internally or externally, you end up become. The Bible said, as we behold his glory like in a mirror, we are transformed unto that same image. But it's the same thing. The Bible said, those that worship idols shall be like the idol. That thing you worship, that thing you keep beholding is what you will end up becoming like. That's why you can't be godly watching pornography. There is a law of conversion that when you keep beholding something, you become impregnated with it. And that pregnancy will be bettered in your life. Your character, your life will finally deliver. But it's the same principle that you used to create success. 
God told Joshua, if you keep meditating on my word day and night, without, you don't need to fast too much. You will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. So that woman, believing for a child, nothing is happening. See what God did to Abraham. This is Genesis 15. God said to Abraham, Behold, thou hast given me no seed. Lo, one body in my house is my heir. Do you see the kind of picture in his mind? Eliezer, his chief servant, will end up being his heir after he's gone. God knew we have a problem. No matter what I prophesy on this guy, it won't happen because just like God cannot drop a child from heaven. If he was going to violate the law, he would have done it with Jesus. All he needed to do is spread his wings, descend like El Shaddai. That's not what he did. He went through a woman. Just like God needs your womb to give you a baby, God needs your heart to incubate your future. If God is giving you a promise and your spirit cannot capture it and incubate it in prayer and in meditation, you keep aborting God's baby. God is not able to do that. You know, the same thing with the law of confession, your mouth. When God was trying to get John the Baptist here, the father of that boy that was to receive a spirit being is coming into the earth. And this spirit being is Elijah. Hmm. There is a prophecy. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming. So God was sending a baby that will come in the anointing. The spirit of Elijah. That's the component I want you to see. That anointing is returning back to earth. And there is a, a little baby that will carry it. And God was sending this holy child to the house of a barren woman and a man that has not had a child called Zachariah. And the angel brings a message just like I'm bringing it to you today. The father, through his doubt, wanted God shut the mouth. Because confession brings possession. Confession creates reality. And confession can abort destiny. Look at the children of Israel that God brought out of Egypt. What they said with their mouth at the border of Canaan. That we are not able to take the land. We are like grasshoppers. God said, eh, as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do to you. It will be to you according to your words. All of you are going to wander in this wilderness till you die. But the young kids, your children, will rise up and go and possess the land. What defeated them? Their mouth. You see, you have to understand this. Your next level is in your tongue. The picture you carry within is the future you will deliver tomorrow. 